Welcome. We're uh, at the Council Chambers, City of Marshalltown, at uh, 10 West State Street. The date is January 25, 2021. The time is 5.30 p.m. And uh, let's uh, do the notice, notice to the public first that the mayor and council welcome comment from the public during discussion of any of the agenda items. You're required to step to the mic, state your name and address for the record, and limit time to three minutes so others may speak. All speakers shall speak clearly, direct your comments to the mayor and council, and not to any uh, counselor specifically. It's at the discretion of the mayor and council to respond to specific questions and comments or to have staff respond during the meeting. Now that we've been called to, the order, called to order, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. Call the roll. Gowdy. Gowdy. Here. Hoop. Here. Ison. Here. Martin. Starks? Here. Thompson? Here. Warren? Here. Very good. Full house tonight, which is nice. We were lacking one last week, and it's nice to have the full house. It's time now for the uh, mayor, council, and administrator comments. Um, let me reserve those so that we can first do uh, two or three other things. Um, and the first one is years of service. Chief Tupper? No? Uh, not me, Your Honor. Oh, it's not you. I'm sorry. Um, Damian Draper actually works in our wastewater treatment plant lab, and he was unable to be here tonight. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Ah, but now we're up for Chief Tupper about the uh, <laughs> uh, canines. <coughs> oh, you didn't bring the dogs? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mike Tupper, Marshtown Police Department, and I'm going to have uh, Lieutenant Kyle Steven Stevenson, I'm sorry, uh, Sergeant Tom Watson, and retired Sergeant Melinda Roop come up with me, please. So these are uh, familiar faces for us. You've uh, seen all three of these folks around, and Mel, when did you retire? 2018. 2018. So Mel's been retired since 2018, but she's still a reserve officer and works in, in the 911 center as well. Um, and as you know, we recently retired uh, our two police uh, dogs, um, and uh, their handlers are here tonight. Lieutenant uh, Kyle Stevenson was Raji's handler, and Sergeant Tom Watson was Jordy's handler for many years. So, and actually, Kyle, he has uh, served our department and our community as a canine handler uh, twice now. He's had two dogs since 2009. Um, and then Sergeant Watson uh, served our community with as a canine handler since 2014. So um, the Marshalltown Police Department has a long history of excellence when it comes to our police dog program. And it has nothing to do with the police chiefs that have worked for the city of Marshalltown. It has everything to do with our handlers. Um, they have been the leaders in this program. Uh, Sergeant Roop um, is, is uh, well known throughout the country as a uh, canine handler and expert, and we've just been very fortunate to have some really rock star people leading this program. So um, I wanted to take the opportunity tonight for, for uh, these folks to, to come into the meeting so we could recognize them for their years of service. Uh, serving as a canine officer, and I've never done it, but I've, I've had the fortune to watch these folks over the last nine years, and, and what I've noticed is that serving as a canine handler requires a lot of things. Uh, it requires a lot of perseverance and patience um, if anybody, th these dogs are like world-class athletes, okay? So we all have dogs and cats at home that are not world-class athletes, and we know how difficult it is to control them sometimes. So they, they have to control these world-class athletes, and, and it takes a lot of perseverance and patience. A ton of hard work, a ton of hard work. Um, a lot of time, dedication, a lot of courage. We ask them to do some really dangerous things because they have these special skills and, 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 the, and this tool. So um, I, I don't even know, countless hours of training, countless hours of caring for the animals, 
um, the dogs move in with them. They become part of the family. And uh, it's like having another, another kid, I'm sure. And uh, they have to put in a lot of effort. Um, it takes a commitment to excellence. Uh, in order to be successful in, in, in this field of law enforcement, you have to have a lot of commitment. When you take on a uh, special assignment like being a canine handler, you have to be all in and you have to be committed to excellence. And, and these folks certainly are. And then for me, I think the, le uh, the most important thing is leadership. And of course, Kyle's a, a lieutenant and Tom's a sergeant. They already have leadership responsibilities in our department. But in order to be successful as a canine handler, they have to have a lot of leadership ability. And certainly Tom and Kyle have demonstrated that time and time again. So before I close, I want to ask uh, uh, Sergeant Roop to come up. And I think she had a couple things she wanted to say, and she had something she wanted to give the, give the guys. Uh, thank you, Chief Tupper. It's um, a little tough for me to, to talk, and I can't look at these guys. Uh, I've been living vicariously through them for a few years as a canine handler. It's in my blood. It's in my system. But I could not have had two more dedicated officers to fill my spot and do it as, better, as well or better than I did. I'm honored that they took my spot and worked in the city of Marshalltown in the capacity as canine handlers and will continue to be amazing officers, leaders for the Marshalltown Police Department. I wanted to uh, present each of them with something that was very special to me when I retired my dogs, and it's a police service badge with the canine's name. It matches the badges that we have. <laughs> so on behalf of the canine program in Marshalltown, from the Marshalltown Police Department, Sergeant Watson for Canine Jordy. Thank you. And Lieutenant Stevenson for Canine Raji. If I can get it open. Wow. So I know any time that my name is on the agenda to recognize people, everybody thinks, oh my God, the Chief's talking again, it's going to take forever, but I really, I really appreciate you all allowing us to come up here and recognize our employees. It means a lot to the, to the employees, it means a lot to our department and the community. And I just want to say on behalf of the Marshalltown Police Department and the City of Marshalltown, um, I cannot say thank you enough to these guys for the work that they've put in. Um, not just as canine handlers, but they've had a lot of other responsibilities in the police department. And uh, they're both rock stars. They both do a great job for, for our department. And so um, in appreciation of your distinguished service, I have a, a couple plaques for you and my, my eternal gratitude for everything that you've done. So thank you very much, guys. I'll make it quick. I've been saying this a lot lately, kind of like a broken record, but I want to thank the members of the community because if it wasn't for such a supportive community, our program wouldn't be where it is today. Along with Sergeant Roop, she is what made this k program what it is. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll echo what Sergeant Watson said. Um, without Melinda's leadership, um, connections, knowledge, um, none of this would be possible. Um, and I look forward to the nice thing about our program is well established and we're going to continue on with that. So I look forward to kind of be involved with that as we go into the future and select replacements for us, kind of like Melinda talked about. Watch our replacements kind of take over and see how it goes from there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Before I go out to the next thing at the, on, the agenda, on my personal agenda tonight, uh, I'd like to mention the fact that what we know is through serving up here for 10 years for me, longer for others, is the number of awards that this program has gotten. And then the community support. It's like with the bicycle program too. When we need something here in, in this town, the money comes out. And, and so if we, you know, whether it's an ambulance for the hospital or a dog or a bike or equipment, the the vest, that sort of thing, this community steps up that we find the money and we get it to you because we know what a, an important job you have and what a good job you do with it. So thanks very much. Thanks, guys. 
The uh, next thing I'd like to do, uh, well, let me ask if anybody else up here would like to speak or the city uh, uh, administrator has anything to the, say tonight. The one thing I will just mention, because I've had a few um, uh, emails and text messages so far, is that uh, please speak into the microphone um, because there are people, uh, quite a few people online tonight, and so we want to make sure that we have some clear audio. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to read this proclamation. Whereas Nancy Stevenson started working at Marstown Area United Way as the office manager in 1978, was promoted to the assistant director in 1987, and then to executive director in 1994, where she has served in this role for 26 years, and whereas volunteerism, education, and health are the core of what Marstown Area United Way does to support our community, and whereas the Marstown Area United Way funds 27 local agencies in the Marstown area, whereas this is a credit to the community, volunteers, and Nancy's steadfast leadership, whereas the recent campaign met its goal of $780,000 during a year that included a pandemic and derecho, whereas through her leadership she's enhanced the lives and vibrancy of our community, and whereas Nancy is retiring after working 43 years at the Marshalltown Area United Way, now therefore be it resolved that I, Mayor Joel Greer, of the City of Marshalltown do proclaim January 29, 2021 as Nancy Stevenson Day. Join us in thanking her for her years of dedicated service to Marshalltown and the surrounding areas. We wish you the very best in retirement. In witness era, whereof I have set my hand and caused my seal to be affixed this uh, 29th day of January 2020, Joel Greer. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, anybody up on the council dais like to speak? All right, let's go on to the next agenda item. Uh, well, and if you would, I'd call for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So I'll motion. Move with the removal of number 13. Okay, if number 13 is off, uh, Gabe, is it your motion then? Yeah, I'll make the motion. And Gary, no, no, Raymond? I'll uh, second. Oh, Raymond seconds, okay. Well, let's uh, call the roll. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Ison? Yes. Martin? Yes. Starks? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Very good. That carried. And when able, please speed read them. Approved minutes from the January 11th, 2021 meeting and bill list in the amount of $3,059,844.34. Appoint Jeff Sims to the Dangerous Building Board of Appeals. Approve liquor license renewals for Fairway, 102 West Anson Street, Jiffy Convenience Store, 111 South 3rd Avenue, Mama de Grado's Pizza, Pasta and Pizza at 2500 South Center Street, Bonds Pub, 22 North 1st Avenue, Wandering Creek, 2436 233rd Street, Hampton Inn and Suites, 20 West Iowa Ave West, Food and Gas Mart, 613 North 3rd Avenue, Casey's General Store, 111 North 3rd Avenue, Plaza Mexico, 903 West Lincoln Way. Approved liquor license change of ownership for Casey's General Stores, Inc. with an update of officers and board of directors for all stores, including 916 East Main Street, 108 Iowa Ave West, 1402 South 12th Avenue, 111 North 3rd Avenue, 1009 West Lincoln Way. Resolution adopting the 2021 and 2022 strategic plan. Resolution to certify unpaid bills for collection with taxes. Resolution awarding the bid for asbestos abatement and demolition of three properties to Lansing Brothers Construction Co. Inc. at the cost of $65,350. Resolution approving the renewal of agreement by and between the City of Marshalltown, Iowa and the State of Iowa, Iowa Veterans Home relating to police protection at the Iowa Veterans Home, Marshalltown, Iowa for three fiscal years beginning July 1st, 2021 and ending June 30th, 2024. Resolution to adopt deed restrictions on Tract A and Tract B of the Southridge Estate Subdivision in the Town of Marshall, Marshall County, Iowa. Resolution to revise stormwater and storm sewer easements in Southridge Estate Subdivision and accept a corrected quit claim. 
Resolution approving engineer statement, engineer statement of completion and accepting of South 6th Street and West Merle Hibbs box culvert repair project being project number SMW19002 with a final project cost in the amount of $59,906. Resolution supporting an application to the FEMA hazard mitigation grant program for a backup generator for the Veterans Memorial Coliseum and providing for a local match. Resolution approving a grant agreement with Natural Resources Conservation Service for the removal of debris from stream channels due to the August 10th, 2020 derecho. Very good. Thank you. Let's uh, address number 13. Is there a motion to approve number 13? So moved, Your Honor. Any second? No second, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, discussion? If I... Yeah, go ahead. If I may, Your Honor. You may. Uh, just uh, one housekeeping item to start with. In paragraph one, uh, subsection C about the elevator, um, I do not believe we completed that in 2020. I think that's going to be done this calendar year. Is that correct? So we determined that the elevator did not need to be fully replaced at this point and just had needed to have some ADA upgrades, which were made. So oh, they um, were made. Yep, they, okay. they were. They were less costly um, in the neighborhood of, I think, $5,000. And so that technically has been completed. And so to amend it, then we'll, we'll remove it from the agreement or state that that was completed um, so that it's there for historical preference. Okay. And then... The only other thing, Your Honor, I have a problem with uh, paragraph two uh, that we will do the snow removal for this, this company, this entity. I think there's a lot of businesses that would love to pay as little as $250 annually to have the city remove their snow. I don't think that's something we want to get into is removing snow from entities outside of city government. So I will be unless if we don't strike that out of there i will be voting no on this okay. thank, thank you your honor sure anyone else like to speak uh, i could open it up to the public for 10 seconds All the lines are unmuted. Okay. That's 10. Let's go ahead and call the roll. My watch is a little fast today because we're getting 10 inches of snow. Thompson? No. Where? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Isom? Yes. Martin? Starks? Yes. Very good. That carried as well. Let's move on to item G, resolutions. Would you read the first one, Juan Abel? Resolution of approving purchase of software upgrades with Tyler Technology Software for the InterGov implementation project. Anyone wish to approve that? So move, move to approve. So moved, Your Honor. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Eisen. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Starks. Any discussion? Great. Thank you, uh, Michelle Sondheimer here, Housing Community Development Director. Um, this is a uh, proposal from Tyler Technologies. They have the Energov software that we utilize for permitting and code enforcement. Um, as was discussed during our strategic planning session um, and during our lean process with our building uh, and community development process review, uh, we determined that there was a need to improve our software system um, to be more compatible and allow for uh, interaction with the public through both application submission and um, through nuisance enforcement and feedback. So um, in addition to that, our software is an, a necessary point of some upgrades as they're changing over some of their platforms. So it was an ideal time to implement some of these new features as well um, as doing the basic necessity upgrades that um, we needed to do to keep functional. So um, in all, the proposed uh, quote that you have uh, before you is 
uh, implementation cost of $56,398, um, and then an annual maintenance, um, essentially, agreement of $13,290 for a five-year period. We will have a small amount of uh, technology uh, equipment needs as well, a couple of iPads, and uh, I know I've talked with like my code enforcement to be able to have a printer in the in the vehicle similar to what the PD might operate with. And so um, we may have a few other expenses that will be taken up into general uh, minor, commute, minor computer budgets. Um, so we'd ask for your approval of this to move forward. They did indicate it would probably take about nine months to fully implement all of the components um, because they'll have to work a lot with staff as we go through the um, set up phases for these things, um, but we would get started um, probably within a, about a two-month window um, as their schedule allows and working with other communities. Thanks, Michelle. Any questions or comments? Your Honor? Yes. So, Michelle, for clarification, so the citizen self-service portion of it, that is going to be an app, you said? Or how is that? Is it going to still function as a website form? Uh, the citizen self-service uh, portal is um, I don't know that it's necessarily an app, but it should be very user-friendly for people. You would create essentially an account like you would with many other services that you might use. Um, so you can log in and submit information um, and then check up and see status alerts and things like that of what's happening, whether it's a permit or um, a complaint that's maybe being received. Um, so so as I understand it, it would, it would have that ability and have that interaction alert type system to you, probably direct to either a text or an email, um, but it would function through through the software. Um, I don't know for certain if they have like an app capability specifically um, to that or not, but I think it is very interactive with mobile devices and, and things like that. It should be uh, responsive in that way. Okay. And I guess the only other question I had is the contract maintenance amount, the 13290 is, how does that compare to what we currently pay from uh, annual maintenance of our contract with them? Uh, Jeff, could maybe you remember that right offhand? I want to say it was around six thousand. I I don't recall. I don't remember either. I apologize. Is this the type of thing where? Oh, okay. Diana says she believes it's around 4000 Okay. Yeah. And I was wondering, if, if on an iPhone I have reported uh, what I consider to be a dangerous or dilapidated building or a nuisance, um, I can then check back a month or two later and see the progress on that? I'm not, could you hear my question, Michelle? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that question, Mayor. Sure, okay. I, I wondered if, when, when, if this is in place, if I report a building that I think is either dangerous or um, uh, in dis disrepair to the extent that it's a nuisance, and I do that on my iPhone, uh, say three months later, if I want to check and see, has there been any progress on it? Has a complaint been filed? Uh, I'll be able to learn that. Uh, yes, I, if I understood you correctly, I, I think you're asking if, like, if you file something, if you can check on the progress on it. And I believe, yes, you would be able to do that if you so choose to follow it and on, on your item. So right. um, you should be able to check and see that a notice has been issued or, you know, what kind of actions are pending or where the review process is. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor. Yes. Um, I know we discussed this in, in length at the strategic planning meetings. Um, we talked about freeing up Joe's time. Um, I think this is a, a step in the right direction uh, because one of the uh, biggest complaints I get is people don't get um, feedback and I think I got to believe that that's one of the modules that's going to exist um, that uh, I think if this doesn't encompass everything I think it's a great step to get more accomplished thank you your honor you're welcome thank you anyone else 
Well, let's open the mic for a quick 10 seconds. I guess unmute is the correct terminology. Mm-hmm. The lines are unmuted. Thank you. Okay, 10 seconds are up. If the clerk ever gets written comments on these things, just go ahead and volunteer that you did. I'll assume that you didn't unless we hear from you. Let's go ahead and call the roll. Starks? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Wynn? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Ison? Yes. Martin? Yes. Very good. Uh, unanimous again. When able, please read the next resolution. Resolution awarding the bids for removal of derecho damaged trees and root walls in the parks to Integrity Service for $100,000. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, Your Honor. Any second? I'll second, Your Honor. Thank you. Discussion. Jeff Hubbard, Parks and Rec Director. Um, as you know, after the storm, uh, we had 800 and some, actually 1,200 and some trees that had dangerous hanging branches in it, which we awarded a contract for the removal of that. Um, during that time, we sent city staff out along with some help of the DNR and found 863 trees in the terraces or our parks that needed to be, um, that either meet the, the category A FEMA of two thirds of canopies missing, um, trunk split halfway down the middle or is leaning more than 30 degrees. So uh, we came up with that list, uh, divided into two groups, one for the terraces, one for the parks. And in the park side, we, we, rec we included the root balls as well of some of the trees that were down. Uh, so on December 31st, we put out a bid and bids were opened up on January 25th, or no, on January 18th. Um, and the low bidder for the parks and root balls was Integrity Services uh, for $100,000. Uh, you can see all the rest of the bids, bids in there. Um, we have contacted them and they feel comfortable with their price. Thank you. Any questions of Jeff or comments? I really don't anticipate, given the number of people participating remotely, I don't anticipate any discussion about this one. Although, if anybody wish, wishes to open the mic or unmute for 10 seconds, let me know. Okay, roll call. Starks? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Isom? Yes. Martin? Yes. Very good. Thank you. When able, read the next one, please. Resolution awarding the bids for removal of derecho damaged, tree, damaged trees on the terrace to Bennett Tree Services for $329,560. Move for approval, Your Honor. Thank you. Second, Your Honor. Thank you. Discussion? So again, Jeff Hubbard, so this is for just the ones on the terrace trees, the 535 trees that are on terraces. Um, and you can see from the bids, uh, Bennett Tree was actually the second lowest bidder. Martin's Tree Service was a lower bidder, but they did not include a bid bond um, and did not feel that they were a responsible bidder. And so we rejected their bid. Thank you for the explanation. Any questions of Jeff or comments? Your Honor, if I may. You may. Hey, Jeff, uh, refresh us and the taxpayers that this does qualify for FEMA partial payment reimbursement, right? Correct. This 80, one and the part of the previous one. Correct. The last two ones, 85% will get reimbursed from FEMA. Yeah, just wanted to make sure that people realize that, that we're going to recoup some of this money. Correct. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. You bet. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Again, this isn't controversial enough to open the... Uh, Phone lines or mics, so let's take a vote. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Isom? Yes. Martin? Yes. Starks? Yes. Very good. That carried as well. Next one, one, one Evo. 
Resolution ordering construction of the final clarifier rehab project WPC 2001 setting public hearing on proposed plan specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost, and directing publication of notice to bidders. Any motion to approve? So moved, Your Honor. Thank you. I'll second. Starks for the second. Thanks. Uh, discussion. Good evening, Justin Nickel, Public Works Director. Uh, for all except Councillor Starks, you may remember we discussed this several months ago. Uh, final clarifier number one and number two at our water pollution control plant have both suffered uh, concrete floor uh, damage, uh, both believed because of high water tables in their adjacent uh, location to the Iowa River. Uh, as such, uh, we had Fox Engineering prepare plans and specifications for repairs to both of those floors. Uh, a smooth, uh, an uncracked concrete floor allows the mechanical uh, systems within both of those clarifiers to operate correctly. Um, we do have an estimated cost at about $1.26 million uh, to repair both clarifier number one and number two. Clarifier number one has, significant, uh, has more significant damage than clarifier number two. And at this time, the cost of this project will be covered with cash available on hand from our sanitary sewer enterprise funds. Uh, are there any questions I can answer, or I believe we do have Bob Ransom, the water pollution control plant superintendent, or Fox Engineering on the go-to meeting? Just a reminder, everybody really needs to have the microphone right next to their mouths. Um, we're getting a lot of comments saying that people can't hear anything that's being said. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments? Again, this isn't controversial and it's something we have to do to comply with the uh, requirements, so let's take a vote. Starks. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Warren. Yes. Gabby. Yes. Hope. Yes. Isom. Yes. Martin. Yes. Very good. Carried. One able. Read the next one. Resolution accepting bid and authorizing the award of contract for the 4th Street and Meadow Lane Storm Sewer Enhancement Project in the City of Marshalltown, Iowa, being project number SMW17001. And there is a correction in the title amount that Public Works Director Justin will clarify. Yes, again, Justin Nickel, Public Works Director. Uh, as the city clerk just read, our title does have an error in the low bid amount, our uh, supporting documentation, the resolution, the bid tabulation, the memo, and the notice of award all have the corrected amount. The corrected low bid amount is $3,090,669.55. That was a bid received last Tuesday from Veith Construction Corporation from Cedar Falls, Iowa. Um, our engineer's estimate of probable cost for this project was $3.54 million. So we did realize a significant savings in the bid. Uh, we anticipate that construction will start in uh, the springtime, uh, presumably April or May, depending on spring rains. Um, and this project is funded uh, with uh, borrowed funds from the 2020 uh, borrowing. Are there any questions I can answer? Hearing none, are there any comments? Point of order. Yes, sir. Have we had a motion. Oh, d we didn't, do we? Uh, I would motion for approval, Your Honor. Thank you. I'll second, Your Honor. Why? I'm asleep at the switch. Sorry, I got the cart before the horse. That's all right. <laughs> uh, Your Honor, if I may. You may. Just, Justin, are uh, the people in this neighborhood uh, finally going to be happy that all this tearing up of their whole neighborhood are gonna, is going to be done this year? Um, I don't ever want to presume anything. <laughs> uh, I would like to think they would be happy with the upgrade in storm sewer capacity in that neighborhood. Um, when ever I get asked that question, I will point out that there will be a rain that will exceed the capacity of the storm sewer system. That always happens. So this does not guarantee that there will be no, no further flooding in this neighborhood. What it does mean is the storm sewer is now up to the capacity that is specified by the state of Iowa. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Your Honor. You bet. Again, something we just have to do to comply. 
Um, I don't think we have to unmute the mics for this one either. Let's go ahead and vote. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hope? Yes. Ison? Yes. Martin? Yes. Starks? Yes. Very good. Thank you, folks. On to the next item H, which is ordinances. Would you read the first one? Ordinance 15007, ratifying and repealing prior ordinances related to Marshalltown Urban Revitalization Area Number 1, third reading. I'd entertain the motion. So moved, Your Honor. Thank you. And Second by Martin. Thank you. Discussion on this one? Maybe we really don't need any discussion since it's our third reading. We've kind of been over this a couple times. If, if there are any questions about it, I'd be happy to answer them. And again, I, I don't anticipate any uh, public response, but yeah, let's just go ahead and vote. Martin? Yes. Starks? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hope? Yes. Ison? Yes. Very good. That one carried as well. Next ordinance. Ordinance 15008, ratifying and repealing prior ordinances related to Marshalltown Urban Revitalization Area Number 2, third reading. Move for approval, Your Honor. Thank you, Gabe. You're on a roll. Is there a second? Yes. Starks for the second. Thank you. Any discussion? I've had two people complain that I'm hard to hear and uh, wonder if I could slip the mask down. Let me slip it up, see if that works. Is that any better? No, that is a little louder, isn't it? Okay. And now you'll all suffer. <laughs> Again, I don't think we're going to be getting any uh, comments in 10 seconds. Let's go ahead and vote. Starks? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Ison? Yes. Martin? Yes. Very good. That carried on to the third ordinance, please. Ordinance 15010, adopting the 2020 National Electric Code, first reading. Move for approval, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Eisen. Second, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Discussion on this one? Okay. Let's vote. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Ison? Yes. Martin? Yes. Starks? Yes. Very good. That carried as well. Let's go on to the fourth and last ordinance. Is there a motion to approve? Well, I'll let you read it first. Ordinance 15011, amending Chapter 77, parking schedules, Schedule 7, snow removal, parking prohibited. First reading, and staff requests the waiving of second and third readings. Is there a motion to approve it? So moved, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Second. Mr. Asim. Discussion. Good evening, Rick Legg, Street Superintendent. Um, our staff, uh, and this is uh, in front of Miller School on South 11th Street, basically from Church Street to Boone Street. Uh, when we pick up our snow, it's similar to the CBD, so we put that into the middle of the street. Um, we've had some issues with residents that live there parking. Uh, on either side of the ridge of snow, therefore making it 
next to impossible for us to pick up the snow. So we're just asking if this section of street um, could be uh, added to the no parking during snow removal operations. Any questions or comments? Your Honor. Yes, sir. Uh, Rick, um, if we do waive the second and third readings, how fast can you get signs up? And are you planning on doing uh, door inserts for the people that face that street that immediately, you know, once this gets published, this is going to change? Right. Um, the signs can be put up temporarily. Um, it's hard with frost on the ground to obviously pound post in. So we can put up temporary signage. Um, and I was also considering just for education or whatever to let everyone on that street know. Most of them are aware of it. It's, it's maybe, you know, one household that we've been having issues with using it for a personal parking lot 24-7, 365. It right. just, so, yeah, that, that's our plan is to go with those addresses along that street that would be affected um, just with the mailing and letting them know that, you know, this is going into effect if approved. Thanks, Rick. Mm -hmm. And Jessica, this would go into effect after the published in the paper, right? If we waive the second and third reading? That's, that's correct. It's only effective upon publication. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Or comments. Um, I'm assuming right now, if we voted positively, it would be to just pass the first reading because I didn't hear, unless unless I missed it, that the motion included waiving the second and third wa reading. So if anybody wants to waive the second and third reading, reading, I think that takes out a new motion. I'll motion to approve waiving the second and third reading. Okay, so you're second to that motion. Second. What's, um, well, it doesn't make sense to take two votes. Yeah, I guess it does. Let's, let's vote on the uh, motion to waive first. Isom. Yes. Martin. Yes. Starks. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Warren. Yes. Gowdy. Gowdy. Yes. Hoop. Yes. Well, given that unanimous uh, vote to waive the third reading, I think it doesn't even make sense to go back to the original motion. Let's consider that that passed. Unless anybody has an objection to doing it that way. Your Honor, I would like you to open up for comments, please. Okay. Let's, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and open up for comments. If uh, we get any, we could reconsider whether we go back to the original motion. The lines are unmuted. Okay. Very good. We consider that one passed. Let's go on to the discussion items. And the, f the first one was is about the infrastructure partnership with Rosemont Companies for Lynn Creek Housing Development. Yes. Who, who would like to speak first? Um, I will be speaking to this one, and we do have with us virtually uh, Mike Hayworth and Tim, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but Tim with uh, ISG, um, who uh, we do have a presentation that I'm going to pull up and kind of let them go through here. Um, but uh, really, just to give you kind of the background of where we are at, is this has been a project um, whereby uh, they have an option on a property that I would say is a very nice piece of property within our community and are looking to do residential development on that property and uh, uh, are looking at a public street. And so as we were talking with them about this project, we were looking at uh, what we had done with Washington Street and Cading Properties and um, the, the dollar amounts on this project are a little bit less. And so um, this is one where uh, we thought it just made sense to talk about how we could go about uh, paying for the public infrastructure involved here in kind of a very similar way. And so 
Tim or Mike, I'm not sure who I'm going to pass it to, uh, but one of you go ahead and, and uh, take over, and then you can just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Awesome. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for having us. Um, just kind of a quick background on us. Um, I'm Mike Hayler, president of Rosemont Companies, um, real estate development firm, uh, looking at the, focusing on housing, uh, specifically in um, smaller communities around Iowa. Um, and then um, Tim Verheen is, uh, is a uh, partner uh, principal for ISG, and uh, um, they are the, they're more uh, more or less my consultant on engineering, architecture, everything associated with it. Um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> We're chuckling because uh, Jessica has to run way up here to the guys to handle the phone and then run down down below for the computer stuff. Got the, got the next slide, though. So, so ISG, a little background on them. They're a very reputable firm um, located all throughout the Midwest um, with offices in Des Moines um, and, and Waterloo um, and uh, Storm Lake as well. Um, if you guys have any specific questions on uh, ISG as a firm, Tim can address that. Um, but uh, from our perspective, um, they're a great fit to uh, bring on to our team. So um, you can go on to the next slide. So we started looking at Marshalltown um, a little while back, um, and uh, we, we've been able to work with you guys now on um, Southridge housing, um, which we're very excited about moving forward with. Um, looking forward to getting construction started this spring. Um, as, as we started looking around town, uh, we came across uh, this piece of property over on 6th. Uh, we we uh, really felt like it was just a, uh, an up-and-coming area uh, with, uh, with, very, with very good uh, proximity to uh, the golf course as well as um, other amenities. Uh, the trail connectivity um, connecting this development into the surrounding neighborhood um, and to downtown and the rest of the services around are very exciting um, and what what is actually one of the items that drives us to be interested in this property um, overall the art district is a uh, is a unique um, kind of a, a hip atmosphere um, with, with different offerings um, that people wouldn't really expect um, there, there's a lot of things that are unknown that uh, I think need to be um, really voiced about Marshalltown and and uh, hopefully being a partner in this area, hopefully we can continue to work on that. Um, like we said, the uh, the amenities around here are exactly what you want for housing development. You want somewhere where you can uh, uh, work, live, and play, um, and, and this is really going to give that uh, that easy access to to all of the uh, um, businesses around town. The downtown uh, atmosphere, along with Wayward Social being close by, and of course the golf course um, being right next to it as well. Um, there's there's proof of proven uh, proven success in development um, with the uh, Crosby Park development. Um, seeing what has been done already in this area shows what uh, what potential it has, um, and really entices us to uh, see what uh, what is possible. So. Um, again, it's just centrally located, and uh, we were excited about the easy access to downtown. So when, when we started looking at this project, we, we started wondering what's, what's really going to be our big challenge, our big hiccup that we need to overcome. Um, Marshalltown is a, uh, a very unique community um, where it has close proximity to a lot of the major communities around it. Uh, Des Moines, Ames, uh, the Cedar Valley, um, Iowa City, Cedar Rapids. Um, it, it services a lot of areas uh, where it can be uh, easily accessed by uh, uh, commuting families that may be going into different areas um, or working in Marshtown as well. And so we're, we're excited about uh, uh, what can possibly happen, but uh, 
there's always going to be challenges. And so um, seeing, seeing this as kind of a, uh, a new style of development for Marshall Pound just brings its, its question of, is it going to be accepted? Um, will the market support what we want to build? Um, looking at the uh, overall uh, price point of what these homes will, will sell for, it's a, uh, it's a t- tough market to uh, hit the appraised values um, in terms of uh, the for sale products. And so everything that we're proposing to build would be for sale. Um, and, and with that, there comes a level of regulation from the, uh, from the banks um, that come from the feds. And so with that, we're just really kind of hit, hit between a rock and a hard place in terms of what we can even ask for. Um, construction costs are continuing to go up. Um, the natural disasters, uh, COVID, everything has made uh, materials more expensive. And so putting all that together, you start really pressing the upper limits of what the, uh, what the project can, uh, can support um, in terms of construction value. Um, and so when you start looking at your construction value, your soft costs, um, the, the overall appraised value starts to really become a concern. So um, that's where, that's where uh, um, combining the construction infrastructure and knowing what our max market can actually be um, it's, it's going to be, uh, it, it could be very difficult to get this to be successful. Um, the, the overall marketability of Marshalltown um, is, is more or less what we're trying to prove. Um, there's a huge community population that uh, comes into Marshalltown every day, and we're looking to just absorb a small portion of that in the work that we're doing around town. So, um, Overall, it's, it's, uh, it, it shows us challenges, but there's also opportunities. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, as we said, the, the challenges are there, um, but what, uh, what, what provides opportunities for successful development are the ability for us to get a higher density uh, development on an info location. Um, being able to utilize existing infrastructure, existing utilities provides minimal impacts on the city's overall um, ma- maintenance budgets, but still allows for increased tax revenues um, that otherwise might not be able to be uh, uh, realized through that property. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a potential stormwater partnership with uh, the Legion Golf Course. Um, it's not necessary, but uh, talking with the golf course, we could uh, uh, potentially be able to bring in a uh, more of an aesthetic um, natural barrier between the uh, uh, golf course and the development, um, providing a pond that could be both as a uh, challenge for, bike, for the golf course, um, but an overall aesthetics uh, improvement for the neighborhood that we're, pro- we're proposing, as well as the, uh, the golf course. Again, touching on the bike trail, uh, that provides great connectivity to uh, the rest of the development, the rest of the city. Uh, close proximity to downtown means that a, a bikeable community is easy to access. Um, the, the down payment assistance is really kind of one of the last big opportunities that we see. Um, and, and the city, the chambers work, uh, some of the private uh, companies that are all participating in that um, that's that's going to be a huge impact on on what we can actually sell these homes for, and so if there ends up being a uh, a gap between the appraised values and and what we can uh, actually sell these for, this will be able to substantially uh, provide a enough of a down payment, enough of assistance for individuals who want to own a home, own their own property rather than rent. It will give them that opportunity, and so. Um, that's that's a uh, that's a major program that uh, we're very impressed with. Um, seeing that from your community means that you guys are uh, looking for the future. You guys are serious about uh, um, growing the community, um, and so we're we're excited to be a part of that. Um, and then lastly, um, discussing with the city possible assistance for the infrastructure uh, in terms of the street and sewer um, just makes this a more viable project. Uh, to the point where it would be challenging to get everything to pencil out if the city were not willing to partner on this. Um, so it's 
it's a uh, it's a great partnership that uh, we we hope we can maximize and uh, really give something that's uh, exciting and, and new for the re- for the rest of the community. Yes, can you go to the next page? So we talked a little bit about the project. Um, if you're not familiar, it's right next to Regent Golf Course on Sixth uh, Street. <clears throat> I think it's owned by the Mountains right now. Um, again, this, this slide just kind of shows the uh, proximity to downtown. It's easy access. Um, this is the proposed concept. Uh, so right now we're showing uh, eight new buses, uh, and then uh, those number units for the townhomes. Uh, 22. Potentially, we could be looking at uh, uh, 24 townhomes. However, we're looking at uh, analyzing the market as units sell to better address uh, which direction we want to go in terms of duplexes versus townhomes. A couple of things uh, that I've made on the concepts. Uh, you can see we're showing right now a wet pond um, kind of split between this property and the golf course. That's what Mike was uh, talking about on the previous slide. Uh, that opportunity to enhance the, uh, the part three that's there. Also, you know, it, it would be nice to move to this development if the view is overlooking the golf course. Um, <clears throat> it's a little hard to read on here, but there's a, uh, we're anticipating some sort of normal buffer between uh, this development and the golf course. So, you know, native grasses uh, that would, you know, deter people from from meandering from this development into the golf course, and that's a concern uh, for the golf course. Uh, but we're also in a, we don't want to restrict views either because we, we see the golf course as an enhancement to this development. Um, the bike trail that you can see, this is a key feature to the development. We're in fact, there's a similar uh, the, the types of folks that are going to work here can be an active lifestyle, and that, that trail connectivity is a, is a key feature in that. Um, but one thing I mentioned on this concept that's still a little bit in flux that Mike talked about, the two lots that, that front 6th Street currently were showing, uh, 10 townhomes. Um, those would be probably the last uh, area to develop. And we're uh, probably just let the market determine what that could be. Uh, we know there's been a little bit of interest in uh, some, some light commercial in that area. It could also be apartments, it could be townhomes, it could be duplexes. Um, there's some opportunity there that's, that's unique to this site, and uh, so we would probably start uh, just west of that and just kind of let that uh, we'll see how things develop and, and go from there. Overall, though, we, we think that uh, this, this development can uh, really add to what's already been established. Like we mentioned, the, the Crosby project that was done just, just south of here, as well as the work being done at Wayward Social, um, it, it's two it's two amenities that uh, have already proven the uh, the success of the neighborhood, um, and so so we see it as being a uh, additional opportunity for what we want to play off of. Um, so Tim Tim can touch on kind of the style and and the the vision of what ISG sees for these units, um, but really kind of what what I see is is making sure that we we blend into what's already there. Um, and not necessarily making something that uh, sticks out too much. So the duplexes, uh, this is a river in the world, what those could potentially look like. As you can see, it's a pretty uh, modern take on a duplex. Um, the, the front windows that you see here, uh, those are the wood in the back. Uh, so they begin to capture that, that golf course view, the golf course you know, lifestyle, if you will. Uh, there's eight of those on the previous concept that all kind of line the north and west part of the golf course. <clears throat> so, yeah, as you see here, it's uh, the larger units on the north and the west. There's one that, that does face south there. Um, those units are approximately uh, 1,600 square feet on the first floor, and they are two bed, two bath, um, and they probably be an unfinished basement in those units. Uh, they would be um, designed so that they could be an aging place type facility, so, you know, zero thresholds, uh, 
walk-in showers, you know, again, limiting the, the curb, all those types of things that um, you might see in a, in a 55 and over type community, um, just so you can age in place there, but it, you know, it, it's things that, you know, we're seeing now in traditional buildings, so not something that would deter a younger uh, user to buy one either. <clears throat> and that's something that, uh, as, as our older citizens are, are aging, they, they find themselves actually being more active as they have more time. And so being able to connect them to, to amenities, um, a lot of the development projects we've seen similar to this around, around the state of Iowa have led towards that path where, where there's probably more uh, 55 plus, 60 plus individuals that are looking to downsize to an extent while finding somewhere that they can uh, uh, really enjoy um, and, ha and have nice, uh, uh, nice finishes, uh, a quality place to live um, for, for the rest of the time. And so um, what this also would provide is a uh, HOA that would maintain all the grounds. And so that's a, uh, that's a key in what we see as being a non-senior housing project. Um, we, we do not want to make people feel like they are living in a nursing home in a uh, senior living. Um, this is just a regular neighborhood, but there's those amenities to where all of your grass would be taken care of, your snow removal would be taken care of, um, all, all the uh, raking, everything like that. Um, and so that can, that can really uh, um, attract uh, young professionals who uh, are looking at uh, longer work days, um, who may want to go spend their free time um, riding their bike, um, going to Wayward Social, enjoying um, what uh, Marshtown has to offer, and they don't want to be taking care of grass, they don't want to be scooping the snow. And so that's something that uh, by providing this, you, you open up a wide range where, again, we're at a price point where maybe maybe a town home is somebody's second home, and they're able to go down south during the winter, knowing that their property is taken care of, all the snow is going to be removed, um, and that somebody's keeping an eye on it as well. And so um, there's some different opportunities there, and uh, um, we think that can really enhance um, the, the type of living um, that this development can provide. And then the next style on the next page is going to be the townhome. Um, yes, so these are uh, two-story townhomes. There's a, a both two- and three-bedroom option, single-car garage. Um, and then it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but the, the garage acts, actually acts as a uh, deck, uh, kind of separating the two uses. So, again, these are four-star units. So some of the feedback that we've got from other uh, similar type developments, you know, throughout the Midwest is when people are, are going to own a property, they like some physical separation. Um, here, there's some common walls, but they're garage walls. So uh, this kind of gives you that, you know, personal feeling that you own something, you, you know, that you're not sharing a, a common wall between the two buildings. Um, so this is a style of home that, that we've seen in other developments that's uh, been really successful. Uh, from our perspective, they're pretty, uh, pretty simplistic, but they, they have a lot of aesthetic value. Um, so they're going to be relatively easy to uh, construct, uh, which allows us to get them on the market at a pretty reasonable cost. Uh, so a lot of bang for your buck, if you would, and uh, pretty modern. Again, as far as that modern kind of style. And uh, these, these photos are taken from a, a similar development that was done in Des Moines. Um, and these, again, are shown anywhere between 12.2 of these units on that, that site concept. So. If that would be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Good presentation. Are there any questions or qu um, comments? One, one thing I'll just pick up on here really quickly is uh, just some initial kind of rough cost 
we are around four hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars in my memo I specified that uh, it, it appears that uh, with the additional funds that we brought into the Edgewood extension project we will not need as much of the capital designated local option sales tax as we had first um, heard and uh, we'll we'll discuss it here as I think the next item in the CIP or that's where it's uh, um, shown that there's approximately four hundred and eighty thousand dollars that would be available from there so um, there's still details to come this would ultimately if you would like to proceed with it come back before you as a development agreement uh, when when that would be uh, uh, basically ready to go they still have some things to do on their end uh, with um, setting up an LLC and ultimately moving forward with the closing on the property as well so there's some additional steps but we wanted to get this out in front of you tonight um, to see if this is something that you would like to move forward with your honor yes sir uh, Jessica how would a special assessment for these 38 houses how would that work if we assess the cost of the four hundred and fifty thousand dollars back to the 38 properties um it depends on whether you would do that what sort of, sort of schedule you would do that at but it would probably be based upon the i think um the the frontage that they would have i believe is how it's been typically done in the past um I, i'd probably need to research it more with justin but basically you would just pass then as a council um i think needing six of seven you to of uh, six of seven of you to approve it um an assessment schedule that then we would file with the county and they would have a bill to pay each year um, over a five peer, five year period, ten year period, whatever that would look like. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Has anybody been able to count? Has yes, go ahead. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to ground maintenance, how is that set up? Is that an assessment basis or uh, some other type of, uh, of uh, Moment. So it's it's actually a, it will be a, an HOA um, with a monthly fee, um, and what that monthly fee would go towards is um, all the expected costs um, through, throughout the year. Okay. Thank you. The other thing that we forgot to mention. Um, Looking at some, some rough numbers of what these homes would end up appraising for, uh, we, we see the city gaining about approximately $10 million of value um, through these properties, um, providing what we see as being uh, potentially 150 to 200,000 um, in taxable value um, that, that would then go back to um, go directly back to the city since we are not going through any type of tax rebates. So you talked a little bit about down payment assistance. Is this something that's already been secured or that you plan on securing in the future? Um, I think the down payment assistance that he referenced was the program that the city or that the chamber has started um, to basically raise a million dollars uh, to put ten thousand dollars towards 100 homes of which the city is participating with 250 thousand towards that so um, that is something that we've uh, had some conversations with with them about um, very early on in in the founding of that program thank you where we stand on that right now I think the chamber has a dedicated two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Cities put in two fifty. Um, some of the banks and corporations have been making private contributions, and I know there's been an ask of the county to consider uh, being in about the two hundred fifty thousand dollar range too. Your Honor. Yes, sir. So I guess just so what directions needed tonight from the council or otherwise? I mean, is it a gauge of the interest of which case I would vocally agree that this is going toward the direction of which we talked about from an expansion of um, offerings within the community for young professionals commuters and otherwise um, I think it's exciting to see this portion of the community be developed and expanded into what it's slowly becoming and so I guess in my voice if that's what the direction is is I would be in support of at least what's currently being discussed at this moment in time 
Yeah, um, so what I would request, just so that we're very clear that there there is not just a consensus, but that there are at least four of you who want us to spend time on this, um, knowing that it's not something that's going to come back to you next week. Uh, we, we would like, uh, I would say I would like a motion to direct staff to move forward with putting together a development agreement. Um, it wouldn't be with Rosemont, it would be with their LLC, but to, to work with Mike and Tim um, to bring back a development agreement for a uh, partnership on the infrastructure. And therefore, I would move to make a motion as such, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would second. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second. Do we, does anybody on the council wish to uh, have further discussion? Yes, Your Honor, if I may. You, you may. Jessica, you're you're suggesting we earmark those leftover funds from Edgewood. Um, what are the restrictions on using those funds? What other projects could we fund rather than building a private street for 38 houses? Um, what else would fall in that, that scope of that $450,000? Well, I, I think that's really kind of a next conversation with the CIP that there are multiple capital projects um, that would fall under that previous designation, including, I think, stormwater and wastewater, as well as um, street projects. So, um, so they, yeah, I mean, we have a whole CIP that's full of projects, um, but ultimately we did not have anything fully designated for the remainder of the capital funds. Yeah, understand, I want... 38 more houses I just don't want to have to build another street because if if all 38 take advantage of the $10,000 payout if that comes to fruition you know we're gonna have that expense no matter where the houses are at but put that on top of the $450,000 um, we're close to what almost half a million dollars investment for a dead end for a cul-de-sac so that, that's my only concern is before we get into the CIP, are we in a position to, to proceed with dedicating a half million dollars to this project? I, I would actually point out that if we would allow those properties to take advantage of the tax abatement, whether it's the three-year 100%, the five-year sliding, or 10-year sliding, we're actually putting more money into it um, with something that's there. So if we would have individuals who would want to take advantage of that $10,000 um, incentive, the city actually saves money in that three-year 100% time frame um, from what we're putting in. Uh, the three-year 100% abatement, I believe, costs the city about $4,000, whereas with the 10000 we're at 2,500 and, and so there's savings to us um, plus the value is on the tax rolls right away. We, we could have talked about doing this as a, a TIF area to reimburse ourselves, um, but it just did not seem like the, the expense that we were talking about and the scope of the project that we were talking about was worth setting up an urban renewal area and then basically doing everything we need to do legally there, which would be probably about a $10,000 cost to start. So uh, knowing that we had a funding source on hand that was not designated towards anything, this seemed to be the best option to bring forward. But there definitely still is that option on the table where we could set up the TIF and reimburse ourselves. Well, the whole return on investment is going to be people wanting a nice housing like this, paying taxes on property taxes. That's, that's going to be where we get the money back. Yeah, and that's the thing with a with a TIF area too is we we would be seeing property taxes being paid, but um, nearly probably like ninety percent would be diverted to repay the infrastructure costs versus going to the school district and the county as well. The Crosby Park development was one of the well was one, is the nicest one new multiple housing developments we've seen since we moved here 30 years ago. And, and I think you could go back another 20 years before that. And it got filled immediately. And so it's, it's exciting to see that neighborhood going like it is. And I'm one of those people who would like to be a snowbird someday. We do have a place down in Texas. Um, getting tired of having a big house that needs to be mowed and shoveled. And um, I'm seriously cons considering going home tonight for dinner and telling my wife, hey, we might have another place to live. <laughs> but I, I shouldn't be talking. I should be asking for other input from the council. Let's go ahead and unmute the mics for this one.
The lines are unmuted. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, Joe Carter. Hi, Joe. You pull open for comment, and it's very hard to hear, but uh, uh, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. This is uh, Joe Carter, uh, uh, co-owner in Crosby Park, and I don't think uh, Mr. Hayworth could have said it any better with regard to uh, how hard it is in Marshalltown with the way appraised values come out to make this work. Uh, Mr. Thompson's uh, uh, comment was uh, very appropriate, but uh, Ms. Kinzer's response was uh, even more appropriate. Uh, we want them to have as many homes uh, that they can build there, and we want to pay that $10,000 per home because the city will win, the county will win, everyone wins. You will pay yourself back every single day by not using tax abatement. But I understand, uh, we, we understood as we built Crosby Park, it was a major uh, concern. Could we get the rental rates we wanted to? Uh, with Rosemont and what they're trying to do uh, in their two projects, uh, specifically this one at Lynn Creek, uh, becomes uh, very concerning, and uh, they're going to have a hard time getting bank funding unless uh, we do some things to help them. But wouldn't it be exciting if we could be getting 30 to 50 homes built in Marshalltown in one uh, quick spot? Uh, and the more we do that, uh, the more uh, that Crosby Park excites or Wayward Social excites Rosemont companies to do things on 6th Street, I would guarantee that that will continue if Rosemont builds on that property and does what they're talking about will excite more developers, more builders who want to come to town, and then we all win. And that's exactly what we've been talking about from the Chamber's viewpoint is to get that 22% commuter rate cut in half over the next five years, and by doing that, we're going to see more tax revenue, we're going to see a wealthier population in town, and wouldn't it be nice if instead of being one of the most impoverished cities in the state, to go back to where we were in the 60s and the 70s, to be one of the wealthiest uh, in the state. So I hope you guys take this uh, very seriously and consider it, and I hope that uh, Rosemont is very interested in continuing the process. So. We're excited. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joe, for your comments, for serving on the uh, chamber, and for your investment in uh, housing in this town. Let's uh, keep the mics open another 10 seconds. Okay. Very Joe, good. Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Charlie, do we ask you for a um, Was anybody else able to hear that? I couldn't. Try again. Charlie, this is Bruce Johnson. I'm on the trials committee, and I really think this addition would be a, a huge positive for our trail system in Marshalltown and the county and all the way you know, from Riverview all the way up to Eldora. So, you know, we'll get there someday, but this would be really put a, a shot in the arm for that. So we very much support it from the, the, uh, the trails um, committee. Thanks, Bruce. We, we could hear that. Sorry, I couldn't hear you at the start. Uh, and thanks for being on the trails committee. It's been a number of years now since I was on it, but I did drive up to Albion a few weeks ago to see what the uh, park is going to look like up there. It is going to be phenomenal really just phenomenal anyway let's uh, let's leave the let's stay unmuted for another 10 seconds the lines are going to remain unmuted for 10 seconds uh, this is Jerry Cohenauer I have a question yes go ahead go ahead Sharon. I understand the need for the down payment this is Jerry Cohenauer for the $10,000 down payment. Are there going to be any restrictions as far as first home buyers? Or I would just hate to get in a situation where somebody lives in a house for three years and then goes to another house for three years and so on. 
Um, so the, the Chambers program, uh, while the, the rules are not final and formalized at this point, is that it's for new homes. So it's more about um, a new property and new taxable value hitting um, the, the market uh, versus someone jumping houses every few years. Um, somebody could actually probably build, uh, it's got to be owner occupied, so somebody would have to be able to be living in that house in order for it to qualify. But final rules are yet to come from the chamber. Uh, this is Joe Carter, and I can address that as well. There's nothing to stop anybody uh, via tax abatement from doing exactly the same thing. Uh, so Jessica is correct that it is for a new home. Uh, it has to be a brand new home built. And so we win with that because then it creates more homes that are available on the market. Uh, and so uh, you are right, uh, Sherry, that uh, a person could do exactly what you're saying unless we wanted to restrict that. But I don't think there's necessarily a, uh, a great desire to want to do that. Uh, uh, they, can, they can do that today under tax abatement. And as I said, if they take advantage of it and they buy the home, they're then taking the risk that they can sell it later. So currently that is not on our list of things to, uh, to um, stop. And, and I, I would like to further uh, what Bruce Johnson said. It's the thing we talked about when we first started talking about Crosby Park with the city council. Uh, with the, uh, and I don't want to lose this, but uh, if we can get through Wayward Social, which Wayward Social is committed to building that trail through their property, to get the property built, or sorry, the bike trail built through uh, what Rosemont uh, Companies is talking about, and then on to the Legion Golf Course, to the right of way to the Sixth Street Bridge. If we can do that, uh, for the first time, we will have a uh, uh, eating and drinking establishments, both the Legion and Wayward Social, that would be on our trail, which we are desperately missing. Thank you, Joe. I think that's a wonderful program, and I, I, uh, the ten thousand dollars is going to be really make it possible for new homes to be built. Um, in, in in addition, um, if businesses would happen to offer relocation assistance to their employees, and um, I think that would even encourage people to move to town. In addition to that ten thousand dollar down payment assistance. I know you're not supposed to talk about your hometowns much, but my hometown of Spencer did that. They they pulled it together, got a ten thousand dollar incentive, and they w were wildly successful getting new housing and uh, new young professionals and young families in them. And, and so that developer did the first phase, did so well. Did the second phase, did so well. Did the third phase. So that's kind of what we're seeing around town right now. But let's keep the mic the mic. Open phones unmuted for another ten. I will be open up. You bet. Live and in person, Terry Busby, 406 New Salem Road, past uh, Emerson Executive now, small business, <coughs> and, and on the Housing Committee. <coughs> Excuse me. I just just emphasized a couple of points Joe made that that'd be hard to make better. But when we think about our uh, 21 percent of our of, of our employment base commutes to Marshalltown greater than 50 miles. That's 1,700 jobs, <clears throat> right? Take that in half. That's 850. We need 850 new build homes in this town. This is an incredible project that starts that momentum. We have others, but if we're going to get if we really want to grow this town. In my opinion, housing is what's going to do it. Historically, we've probably averaged 10 houses a year for the last 30 years. And then you wonder why we are what we are. And until we grow the housing capability of this town, <coughs> continue to build on the amenities we have, we're not going to grow the town. We're not going to have the other new things that we'd all desire. So to me, as Joe said, the ability to attack that community rate, that is in fact why Rosemont is interested. They see Marshalltown as a town that has a very high commuter rate. They see a lot of these new amenities coming in. And so between the new housing bill, <coughs> and then I'll go ahead and pile on to the trails, I think it's a, a phenomenal thing. We, we do have businesses like a Wayward. It's been difficult. 
It's been difficult the last year. It's difficult to start a new business up. But I really believe with trails, I would love to see people sitting in Marshalltown, looking around and all of a sudden saying, where am I at? They're in Marshalltown, Iowa, looking at things, seeing things, and seeing the development in the city that has not been done in a long time. So I really believe this is an incredible project. I applaud uh, the Rosemont team for taking it as far as they have. And I would certainly really like to see the council support behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Let's go another 10. Very good. I think we're at that point. If we haven't got a motion on the table, we should uh, solicit one. We have one, don't we? Yes, Your Honor, we have we a did. motion on okay, the table. Okay, good. Well, let's take the vote. Starks? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Dowdy? Yes. Hope? Yes. Ison? Yes. Martin? Yes. I think that's pretty good direction for staff. And, and now that that's passed, I have to say this is one of the most exciting things I've seen as mayor or being on the council for 10 years. It really is. That's just phenomenal. Well, let's go on and talk about um, something I shouldn't say less exciting, but actually involving less <laughs> money. <laughs> and that would be the municipal bond <laughs> lobby. <laughs> Hi, this is Diana Stone, our finance director. Uh, full disclosure, I am a participant in the Marshalltown Municipal Band. Um, I do not take payments since I've become a city employee. So anyway, the city band levy, it's very simple. Whatever we levy, we pass on to the band. They use it for um, their director and musicians, equipment, and music. Um, so normally in the past, we've had $11,000 levied. So if we continue doing that, that is 1.2 cents. Um, the reason we're bringing this up this year is because last summer was the pandemic and they did not have any concerts. So therefore, they have a cash balance and uh, you were provided that in your packet. Um, I had originally budgeted, I had originally just thrown in $3,000. So that's 0.3% or 0.3 cents. Um, so we, ha we don't have to decide the levy tonight, but uh, it is part of the general fund expenses that we need authority to spend. Um, Matt, Harry, uh, Herrick, the president of the band, is on <coughs> the line. Um, so, do you have any questions? Any questions or comments? Your Honor. Yes, sir. Uh, Diana, um, so refresh everyone's memory again. Where's the levy at today? What's the amount? Well, okay, so it's a percentage of the valuation. So that's what I gave you for just the band. The overall levy we'll be discussing at the next council meeting. Okay. Most of that is driven by the, uh, the debt service levy. And right Wh now, whether you're going to contribute local option sales tax to buy it down like you've done in the past. But right now, we're not levying the maximum amount to the taxpayers on the band levy, are we? No. Okay. And 100% strictly passed through. There's no administrative fees coming to us. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Any other questions or comments? What sort of direction are the staff looking for on this one? Um, so as the president had outlined in his memo, I mean, there's several ways you can go. You can decrease the levy, t totally take it down to basically nothing this year, you know, and, and build it back up in future years. Um, or, you know, just tell me what you want to do. Because it's, it's such a tiny change in the, in the levy amount that it, it doesn't make much difference. And I can't think of anybody that would know better which of the three options we should do than somebody who's on the band and uh, knows something about finances. 
What's, well, what's your preference? I mean, I think I think the the um, the band just wants some kind of assurance that you know if it's three thousand dollars this year and three thousand dollars the next year, make sure you bring it back to eleven thousand once they spend their cash balance back down. Okay. Your Honor. Yes, sir. I'm just afraid if we lower it three years from now, someone's going to forget why we lowered it, and they're going to be hesitant to bring it back up. I know a lot of services still pay their employees, you know, for... Okay, they, they don't pay their... I they, know, but I'm they, just, I'm okay. just, I'm, I'm trying to use, to actually yeah. use an example of another service that wasn't meeting all the needs of the, the customer base, but we were still paying the employees. Um, I guess my feeling is we leave the levy where it is and we keep it that way and just keep moving forward and and leave it to the band's discretion to use this year windfall that they got because I'm sure like any other organization we underfunded them <laughs> for years and they could probably use a little more money. Um, based on the number of concerts that they have during the summertime, um, you know, they pay their musicians a flat fee for the rehearsal and then also for the concert and then they pay the director. Of course, there's music costs and instruments. So last year it was just like, you know, you didn't spend eleven thousand dollars because you didn't have any concerts. So there is a gain there. So we could drop it, whatever amount. But you want to keep something in there just to remember that there was a levy there. Yeah, I, I guess I feel like we should leave it the same and and move just status quo on this one. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. You bet. Anybody else want to weigh in? We're, we're getting word that we're being hard to hear again, so I'll try to speak in as close as I can to the mic. There's plenty of seats in the council chambers. Yeah, we do have room here now, don't we? Anyone else, though, wa want to weigh in? Frankly, I like your idea because if, if, if we have another year like last year and it accumulates high enough. In a, in a f future year, the council will figure out, well, you know, they've got, they've got enough of a war chest going, we could skate for a while. I move to proceed with Gary's suggestion. Thank you. To leave the levy at $11,000. As, as is. Yeah. Do you second that one, Gary? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Okay. I was guessing that. Any other discussion? It, hearing none, let's call the roll. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hope? Yes. Isom? Yes. Martin? Yes. Starks? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now let's go on to the third one, which is discussion of the for year 21 to 25 capital improvement plan second draft. I made the mistake of telling my wife I thought I'd be home by 7 o'clock tonight. It's, it's budget season, Your Honor. Yep, <laughs> it is. Um, I know that we are having some major audio difficulties for those online, so as long as you can hear me clearly, I'm going to have Diana sit at this microphone when we come into the other items so that hopefully um, the audio will be a little bit better because we do have a lot of content coming up that is very important. So um, I, I hope for, uh, for our three council members online that you can, you can hear what we're talking about and uh, things will work out okay here. Um, so the, the capital improvement plan, we talked about it at the last council meeting and we had some things that were really unknown at that point. And so uh, those things then clarified themselves here in the last um, few weeks, uh, mostly that we got our valuations. Um, I'm happy to report that you know those valuations really only impact fund 030 and that uh, we were able to uh, be very uh, close with our targets. Um, for revenue. So uh, that worked out pretty well. So we didn't have any major things to change. One thing that you had asked for in the last meeting was what did we ask departments to reduce out of fund 030 in order for us to um, make that fund balance. And I've listed those items in the attached memo. 
we also have um, a few changes that happened as well with the special events trailer and then um, adding in the cost of a uh, quote for some Microsoft licenses for our use of software and for our servers um, that are actuals now. So uh, fund 030 did change a little bit. Uh, fund 110, the road use tax fund, which we will be talking about just a little bit later, um, that actually changed as well. Um, we had some uh, things that were uh, kind of in the translation between um, Tyler, our financial software, and Planet, which do not communicate. We have to be the point of communication. Uh, there were things that were happening in the in the current fiscal year in terms of paying for things, which were approved in prior years, um, that were actually showing up. So we moved things. Um, into this current fiscal year to make things match up a little bit better uh, with what you'll see in the report from the Tyler financial software system. So otherwise, besides those two funds, everything that uh, you we, we had last week, um, which included uh, the, um, the detail report, which is basically information on every single project, and it's 300 and some pages, and so there's a, a lot that's there. Um, or the, uh, the source report, which is basically um, identifying the fund in which a project would be paid out of, uh, that is uh, basically the same except for fund 030 and 110. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the capital improvement plan. There is a God. <laughs> but nobody had any questions. I'm getting hungry. Um, so basically, this one uh, will come back on February 22nd. You'll have a resolution to set a public hearing on it with the public hearing to occur at the March 22nd meeting um, with the adoption of the capital improvement plan at that time. Ready for the next topic? Let's go. go. You, you bet. And I did get worried again that that microphone is better than the rest, but it's not very good. Okay, Diana, fi Diana Steiner, Finance Director. So first we want to talk about the valuations. Oh, Jessica, I need my packets. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> do you want this right here, or do you want me to just pull stuff up on? Um, if you could pull it up, that'd be great. So, um, you talk about property tax valuations. So if you go to the first handout, it shows a history from fiscal year 18 through uh, projected FY22, our tax valuations. So uh, residential went up by 15 million. Uh, commercial property actually went down by 114,000. Industrial went up 3.9 million. Multi-residential went up 1.8 million, and gas and electric utilities went down 9 million. So I called the state to see why the gas and electric went down. They told me that there was a correction for Alliant. They overstated their acquisition costs in prior years, <coughs> so that's why that went down. So as you know, the difference between taxable valuation and assessed value is the rollback. And on the right there is the percentages of the rollback depending on what category it is. So re residential went up slightly, 1.33%. Per uh, Multi-residential continues to go down 3.75% every year and will continue to go down until it, heat, until it hits the residential rate. Commercial and industrial stay the same. So commercial and industrial, uh, the legislature is uh, supposed to appropriate the 10% difference. Um, their pool of money keeps getting smaller, so therefore our, our money that we get gets smaller as well. So any questions on this handout? If not, go on, we'll go to the next handout. So when we're, when we're trying to figure our general fund budget, we have to look at the valuations 
and then we use the 810 regular general levy and the 27 cent emergency levy for our revenue sources. So for fiscal year 22, <laughs> our regular was $908 million. So that increased from last year of 4.3 million, but it's only a 0.48%. You can see in prior years, it's been between 1.8 and 5.3%. So in dollars, this is what hurts us. It's only a $36,000 increase. And you can see in prior, last year it was 221,000. The year before that was 370,000. So uh, it was very disappointing to get our valuations this year. And so when we go on to our next topic, which is gonna be the general fund budget, we are going to talk about why we have a deficit. So first of all, I wanted to say that um, the directors went in and made their adjustments and then the city administrator and myself uh, met with each director to look over their budgets. So we're actually doing two budgets. We're doing the fiscal year 21 re-estimated budget, which is this current fiscal year. And then we're also doing the FY22 budget that will start in July. So basically we had uh, status quo programming, except for the YSS contract with the police department, which you approved at 75,000 for this year and next year. Of course, there's always inflation. A lot of the maintenance agreements automatically have a escalation clause in them. And there's wage increases. So uh, wage increases, uh, we're already negotiated for the union contracts. So we put in a 2.5% increase for non-union people. That's been our past practice to do that. Um, health insurance, we budgeted an increase of 7.5% of which the employer would pay 85% of that increase. Um, there's a lot of items here that are listed, so I'm not gonna read them all, but I, I will touch on a few. Um, item number six, road use tax is transferred to the general fund to cover gross wages of the public works department. Number seven, the levy and related expense for the Fisher Community Center continues to be budgeted at $100,000. You just discussed that a few meetings ago. Um, item 10, the back fund from the state is budgeted at 75% to be conservative. Again, that's that little back I talked to, to you about on the valuation sheets. Number 13, the general liability and property insurance are estimated with a 10% increase for this fiscal year and an additional 5% increase for FY22. Because of the dry chair, the ICAP pool um, is going to take a big hit. So we don't actually know what our premium is going to be until March. But that's what we're estimating right now. Hotel, hotel motel tax. Um, is kind of tricky because they only pay quarterly and they're, you know, a quarter behind when they do pay us. Uh, with the pandemic, we don't know if, if companies are going to continue to travel less. Um, now that everybody's gotten kind of used to go to meetings, there may not be as many um, conventions potentially in town anymore, um, stuff like that. So. That's a hard number to budget. Um, currently, we're budgeting $400,000, and we turn around and give 67% of that to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. That number could be changed as well. Um, for most of our other rev general fund revenues, we are taking it back to pre-COVID levels. Whether that's uh, realistic or not, we don't know. Um, I did want to mention that uh, in fiscal year 21, uh, we did receive some CARES Act dollars from the federal government that passed through the state. And I wanted to mention that we did not budget anything for TV. Uh, last year at this time, we had the same discussion and uh, council decided to use the local option sales tax to pay for that. I think at the next meeting, um, McTV will be making a presentation as well to continue funding. So overall, 
our deficit for fiscal year 22 is $137,000. So on the next page, you can see some options that we put together. Can you change that? <laughs> um, so it's on top of the page, $137,000 deficit. We kind of subtracted off the 75,000 because that's the YSS contract with the police department that you already approved. So we thought we could at least use the fund balance uh, for that CARES Act money um, carrying forward. So that leaves us at a $62,000 deficit. So an option would be to reduce the agreement with the chamber for tourism and marketing. So again, if you went from paying them 67%, which is 268,000 to 50%, that would save $38,000 a year or something in between if you wanted a different percentage. Um, like I said, we could reduce the non-bargaining wage increase. It's currently at 2.5% budgeted. For every 0.5%, you'd save about $28,000. You could just transfer local option sales tax, council designated to buy down the deficit. You've done that before as well. Um, normally, we budget that to put us in balance. And then what actually happens is we didn't need it, so then we don't transfer it. Um, you could use uh, the fund balance again we're projecting a carry forward surplus in FY21 of around $400,000. So you could just use that. Uh, the option five is to reduce some or all of the line items below. So each department went back through and said, well, if we had to cut, what would we do? And th these are the items that they came up with. If you go to the next page, um, it does show you the, our fund balance. So at June 30th of 2020, we rolled in with a $2.1 million fund balance. We're looking at a surplus of 428000 this year, primarily due to the CARES Act. That leaves the fund balance at the end of this fiscal year of 2.5. For FY22, we're looking at a deficit of 137000 So that would leave our ending fund balance at June 30th at 2.4. So we need your direction of how to remove this deficit or how, whether to reduce costs or to transfer in money. So we need to have that discussion. Your Honor. Yes, sir. So I guess my question with the $400,000 surplus from the CARES, all that's unallocated, unallocated at this point in time? Correct. And I guess why would we I guess not knowing if the options are listed in order of preference, why would we not go with option four out of the options listed? Why would we uh, keep an additional surplus in the fund that we're talking about well, eliminating a deficit? The advantage is that it looks to the public like you're in balance because revenues will e equal expenses. Where if you're using the fund balance, it's gonna it's gonna look on paper like you're in a deficit. I, you're budgeting a deficit. And I, I think the other thing to sort of expand on that is that this is not likely the last year that we'll have a deficit. It's not the first year that we've had a deficit and had to come to all of you for something. And so we that's kind of a later on where we've done some projections of what that structural deficit looks like. And so um, the CARES Act dollars, as well as then the other uh, revenue that came in way over uh, what we had expected was our building permits. Um, I think we've budgeted 375,000, whereas we started out the, you know, last year at this time saying 100 160,000 so significantly more in building permit revenue this year than we thought um, so it's it's we're looking at the budget that we believe that we can target uh, we just see some of those one-time revenues as not being something that's going to be there uh, for the long term so um, it is certainly option four is definitely the way to to buy time 
to give us um, the chance to talk about more options and ways to uh, hopefully bring the general fund back back into a a long-term type of balance situation where we don't have to have this conversation every year um, but at least for uh, where we're at right now it's it's one of multiple options that you really could look at so I guess to that point though if I look at all five options I mean the only one in my opinion that really aligns with the long-term future projections of the, I mean, what the deficit can look like would be option one. I mean, I think continuing to reduce wage increases year over year isn't sustainable. Uh, I would argue that the best use of funds for council designated loss isn't to cover a deficit. I would argue that nitpicking line items from the departments doesn't make sense to me. Um, and obviously there's only so much of a surplus with regards to what the general fund currently has. So that's not sustainable. So, I mean, obviously a, a bigger question to address as the projection that was put in front in, in a, one of the other attachments, I guess, I don't know how we, at least in the, in the near term, I guess option four seems like the most realistic in my opinion. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with some of the other options, but I'll let others weigh in there. So I guess I guess my only point is none of these options seem like a long-term fix to what looks to be a possible problem moving forward. The options are not in any particular order. We just listed them. We got that. <laughs> Your Honor, if yes. I may. Um, I hear what... Councilman Eisen was saying, and th these are some tough decisions. I think the department heads have done a wonderful job. I, I don't like nitpicking them even further with this nickel and dime stuff. Um, I guess my feeling is option one, um, that's 268000 a year. Is that correct? 67% right. of the... The 400,000? Yes. Okay. Um, since I was a member of the chamber as a business owner, I've seen the chamber turn to a lobbyist group. And should we be really seriously using taxpayers' money to fund a group that's, that's a lobbyist? And we could hire anyone to do convention and business tourism marketing for us so I think the quick fix is is we just stop funding the chamber at a rate of two hundred and sixty eight thousand dollars a year um, that solves the deficit and gives us a little breathing room and then plus leaves us that cushion that we can carry on that four hundred thousand to 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 uh, future years because we don't know what's going to happen after this so I guess I would be in favor of, um, of shutting off the tourism and marketing money and then maybe putting something out to bid for anyone to come back and bid on that at it, it, a greatly reduced rate. So that, that is one distinction to really make clear here is that Iowa Code does require us to use 50% of those funds for convention and tourism. So it would not be the general fund being able to reclaim that entire amount that okay. there would be approximately 200,000. Well, that, that leaves 130, 134 then. Yeah, so there there would need to be at least 50% of that budget that would uh, that funding that would need to go to support the state mandated requirements basically. Yeah. Once again, we're looking at more than enough to wave to uh, override the deficit. You're correct, and that's why it's there as an option. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Thank you. Well, I suppose there are ways to do a combination of these things too doesn't have to be just one option. Anybody else want to weigh in? I guess my only comment, Your Honor, um, would be back to, to Gary is I don't disagree and I know it's been a topic of conversation over at least since I've been on the council with regards to what that percentage is from the hotel motel tax. Um, 
I agree that there's should be an evaluation of what that looks like in decreasing year over year. I think one foul swoop. Um, I guess I won't understand what that looks like from an impact of what we already have committed and otherwise communicated to the chamber with regards to what they're providing today. I I don't disagree with the type of the conversation, but I I think immediately dropping that would require some additional insight for awareness. Your Honor? Yes, sir. If we dropped it to the 50%, so we took 17% away. You'd save 68,000. Which would be a, your 62, 193 would cover that. Right. So they would lose. 68,000. 68, yeah, $68,000. We'd take $68,000 away from them, which is probably that whole department, right? They have one person. They receive 268000 is what we'd send them now. Right. So, yes, they do employ uh, one person, and then there are grants and things that they provide out as well. I think we would need to invite the chamber here to um, give you a better idea of what that money is used for uh, because I don't think we could speak to it at this point. And, and, and I'm okay with that, but the problem I have with that is money going into one account, you know, it gets, it gets muddied. I, you know, I'd like to know what the chamber's spending since they're of receiving our funding. I'd like to know how much they're paying the national, you know, chamber of commerce, how much, you know, that when they do do tourism information and print, you know, travel guides and things, I don't think they're using local printers here in Marshalltown. I mean, we're using taxpayers' money. Again, it's, it's hotel motel tax people coming to Marshtown, but we sure seem to be sending a lot of taxpayers' money back out the door to other organizations. I just don't see anything else on here. You know, I agree with, with uh, Mr. Isom that, you know, if, if we transfer lost funds, I mean, we're just, we're putting a Band-Aid on it. And I, I agree, you know, the cost of living wages can't be reduced. Um, I, just, I just see that as the only viable option um, and, and, and owning up to the taxpayers of what we're using their money for. Would, would you all like us to see if the chamber can come on February 1st to the next budget meeting and uh, let you know more about the, the contract that we're operating under and how they've used the funds? I think it addresses some of the conversation tonight, so I think that would be appropriate. The uh, the only other question and clarification I had with regards to that 268,000 or that what the 67 percent equates out to now, that is less than what they would be receiving in a normal operating year. Is that a fair statement? Obviously, since that revenue generated off hotel motel taxes down significantly, or what does that I guess equate to or look like? I'm just. Are, are we talking in a years to year apples and apples comparison with regards to what those dollars typically are versus what it is today? For fiscal year 21, we received 488,000, so it's 67% more of that, of 88,000. And in a but in the more prior normal years, year. It, I mean, it's, it keep, continues to go up. It had been going up every year until the COVID hit. So they it, always got the benefit of that 67% increase. And your honor, yeah. if, I, if I may, I honestly think they had a couple windfall years with, you know, the tornado. I think most of the hotels were booked up. Yeah. You know, I think they were the big recipient of that, besides the hotel owners, obviously. Right. But that's, that's the kind of information we need to see, though. We need to see where their money, you know, they, we are funding them. Like anything else that we fund, just like plowing the snow next door now. You know, we're funding organizations outside of the taxpayer's expectation, I guess. That's what I want to see is I, I, I need to see, 
accountability for all these organizations that we're using taxpayers' money for. So, so we do have accountability, and I'll email this out to all of you. We do have an annual agreement for this, which mm -hmm. specifies certain things, reporting and stuff like that. So there is accountability that, that we are building into those agreements and things. So yeah, I'll email you out or have Alicia email out to you the, the current agreement that we're operating under so you have a better idea of what services they are providing to us in exchange for this very specific revenue stream. Uh, we also have an agreement with the Chamber for Economic Development Services, which comes from a wholly different revenue stream uh, under a wholly different agreement as well. And then we do pay $500 a year in dues, I believe, as well, that goes into their, their general um, fund as well. To answer your question, does anybody have an objection to inviting the Chamber here for the next meeting? Let's do it. And I just want to clarify, Your Honor, if I may. I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm just saying of the five that the staff has brought to us, um, it's the least objectionable to me. So I'm not saying that's the direction we'll go if they come and present. I just would like to hear. Is that acceptable, Your Honor? I feel like any time that any of you have questions about the contracts that we have in place and the funding um, that we are providing to other organizations under those contracts, then, then certainly they, they should be able to come here and to tell you more about what's going on. One of the things with COVID that we haven't done um, really in the last year is have um, that report item on the agenda. And so that's probably where you've missed out on a number of reports from organizations because that would be that time period when we would typically have them here to let them let let you know more about what they've done in a past quarter and things like that. So so yeah, we can we can certainly do that. The February first meeting is a is a special meeting, and so uh, they'll they'll be able to present to you in kind of a, a different, a little bit more relaxed way because we won't have the formal agenda uh, process. So at the next meeting, we'll be bringing the local option sales tax. So like I said, we, there is nothing budgeted right now in, for MCTV in this general fund budget. So um, if that's going to be a transfer from local option sales tax and we're just not going to spend that money anymore, I need to know that as well. And so the uh, MCTV, um, Jackie Goodman with Iowa Valley Community College District has reached out um, and said that they would like to uh, bring forward a funding proposal. And so I have requested that they come to the February 1st meeting as well, which is when we will be talking about local option sales taxes. Um, as you can see, there's really not additional money in the general fund to, to kind of go around for that. Your Honor. Yes, sir. Are there other organizations that should come to that same meeting? since we're discussing budget and outside organizations? We, we have not put out a call for funding to outside organizations. Um, no, no, I mean, I mean existing ones, like um, MCTV in, in the chamber. I, I, there, there are no other organizations. Well, I don't mean impact. I mean, that's brand new. Uh, right. There's, there's no other contractual organizations that or contractual relationships where we have a, uh, something that expires basically as of June 30th that I can think of at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. And so are, are you wanting to leave a, on paper, if we get rid of the 62,000 through whatever sources, are you wanting to still show that there's a deficit of 75,000? Because remember, for that YSS contract, we were going to, mm -hmm. we could use the fund balance carry forward. Or do you want to transfer money in from some other source? Can we wait till that after that meeting? Sure. Yeah, and, and I'll just say it's from our side of things that we're recommending that you look at this as a deficit of $62,193. Right. It was the CARES Act funds that uh, really, I think, motivated you all to fund 100% of that first year, knowing a calendar year has two fiscal years. And so that's that's really where we're encouraging you to look at this as a deficit of $62,193. Do you need a motion, Your Honor? I do. To go, you need a motion to go that direction that we talked about? I, I don't think we need a motion at this point in time, unless somebody wants to make a motion for a specific option to reduce the, 
the general fund deficit at this point, but it doesn't sound like we're, we're at that point. It, it, I, th I suppose we could leave it as a consensus that we'll hear from the chamber and uh, revisit this. This is just a discussion item tonight. Yeah, I mean, if if uh, if somebody wants to make a motion that there's something on there or a combination, certainly do so. But if you're asking for more information for the chamber, it would be my opinion that it's premature to say that's the option to go with. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next report is the budget comparison report. So I just wanted to make a few comments on that. So this is the report that comes out of our accounting system and you will see it over and over during this budget cycle. So the first column of numbers is what we ended with in fiscal year 20, which was at June 30th, 2020. The next column is our total adopted budget, which you committed to last March. And the next column is what, we earn, what we've earned or spent through uh, December, so six months. The next budget is our <coughs> re-estimated budget or what we were going to put through for our budget amendment. And then the next column is our FY22 budget request. So if you recall earlier in the, the spring, um, the CARES Act came along because of the camp pandemic and the federal government sent uh, the state of Iowa some money to help local governments. So. Iowa allocated $125 million. $100 million of that was supposed to go to cities and counties, and then $25 million was supposed to go to the local match for FEMA. So on the report here, um, you can see where I marked FY21 CARES grant. So for the police department, we put 368000 So that was this year. We're not going to get it next year, or we have no... Um, idea whether we will get anything like that under the new Congress or not. So that's on that page. I'm just going to hit some highlights here. On the next page, can you pull down the next page, Jessica? One second here. Okay. Um, there's a, I'm still getting comments that you're, you're, there's some static interference, so if you can maybe keep your mask from hitting the microphone. Okay. How's that? On page two, under uh, account number 001-1010-5230, consulting and professional fees, that's where that $75,000 is for YSS. And it has another 4200 just for other consulting. On page three, under 001-1010-5718, minor equipment, that's for those uh, $200,000 of police radios that you had approved. So again, one time in FY21, nothing for FY22. On the next page, four, you see the fire department getting their CARES grant. I'm going to skip. Just trying to point out some items that are, are not, comp that are different from FY21 to FY22. So if you go to page 10 of 37, under function 2010, you'll see that the adopted budget, the second column, is quite a bit higher than the fourth column, which is our amended budget. That's because of all the costs that uh, in got incurred with the derecho. So we're putting those expenses in a different fund, so we reduce the am amount of budget in this one. So when you're doing a comparison between fiscal year 21 amended and, and FY22, it's not a, as big of an adjustment as you think because we reduced last year, this year's budget. On page 15, under the airport, they also received a $30,000 in the CARES grant. And under the farm rent, uh, fiscal year 21 amended contains two months of payments. I'm not, not two, two months, two years of payments. So 
So just timing wise, we have two years in FY21, one year in FY22. On page 17 is the library. Um, it does not contain the revenue for the levy. That sits in function 6021, the finance budget. So to look at their total operations, you'd have to add in another $245,000 in their revenue to see what their actual operations are. So basically, it costs um, their net expense is a million dollars on page 19 under function function 4020 is the, is the band again that's where we just talked about we have 11,000 this year and I will change it to 11,000 next year rather than the 3,000 whatever we levy goes right back out to them On page 25, at the top of the page, function 4060, is that's the $100,000 that we give to the Fisher Community Center. Again, we levy for that and pass it through. On page 30, under the finance function, this is where all the property tax levies go. Um, and under 001-6021-4011, delinquent property taxes. As you recall, the property taxes, um, the governor ordered that they could be deferred because of the pandemic. So in the past, our delinquent property taxes are only about $2,000, but we got $100,000 in this year for, they should have posted last year, but got deferred so we're not counting on that for next year of course or um, ever right yeah <laughs> uh, let's see what else um, on page 31 under 001 60 the utility excise tax again our uh, valuations went down for gas and electric so our revenues went down and the backfill is on line 001 60 21 4339 so that's the rollback that i talked about earlier you can see our amended budget is 225,000 for this year and we're budgeting 206 for next year on page 35 of 37 uh, the cable TV again nothing budgeted for FY 22 and on page 36 I'm going to talk about the transfers out so there are certain instances where uh, the revenue generated has to go into a special revenue fund and then can be transferred from there so road use tax is one example. So we get um, road use tax from <coughs> tax at the gas pumps and the vehicle registrations. The money comes in there. We pay for projects and then reimburse the general fund for the public works department. So that's what that transfer is for road use tax. The next one is the employee benefit fund. So again, we levy the property tax it goes into the special revenue employee benefit fund and then whatever we actually spend over in the general fund we transfer the money back to the general fund same for the police retirement on the next line transfer from emergency that's our 27 cent emergency tax levy so whatever we collect in that fund we transfer back to the general fund Uh, the transfer from TIF, so that's the facade and code grants. It gets paid out of the general fund, and then we transfer the money from TIF to the general fund. 
and then the expenses for the transfers out and we have some money going to the dangerous and dilapidated fund and then also for transit so transit comes in to the general fund and then we send it back out whatever we collect and they also received CARES grant money, so that is why we're going to le le levy less this year for FY22. Any questions on this document? Your Honor? Yes. Remind me when will we know on the backfill amount? When, when was that last year? When did they finally? It's whenever the legislature appropriates it. So... They went to what, March? I think they got out of session early last year, so March or April before it was decided. They were back in June, so I don't think okay. it was official until they... Yeah, I, okay. I thought it was late last okay. year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that's why we're trying to be conservative with the back family budgeted 75% of what we are actually owed. And there is no more CARES Act money that we are expecting right none whatsoever nothing that congress has passed at this point in time okay okay moving on to the next handout is the employee benefit fund the police and fire retirement fund and the emergency fund so as you can see in my memo the employee benefit fund covers FICA, IPERS, health insurance, workers' comp, unemployment, uh, retired health savings account for staff. So again, we levy this money. It comes into the special revenue fund, 112, and then we transfer it to the general fund for what we actually need. We did budget a 7.5% health insurance increase for FY22. Of that, uh, the employee will pick up 15% and the city will pick up 85%. For Fund 117, this is a police and fire retirement account. Um, their rates continue to go up statewide. It's going from 25.31% to 26.18%. And then the emergency fund is the straight 27 cents levy that we collect in Fund 119 and move to the general fund. So on the second page, you can see the, what our projected cash balances are in those accounts. Now they do look quite big for the employee benefits fund, but again, we don't know for sure what our premiums are gonna be, and we are self-insured. So if we need more money, we gotta get it some from someplace. So we have a little fund balance there. Your Honor. Yes, sir. Can we ask Mike and Dave to put a moratorium on retirement? <laughs> <laughs> Take that as a no. Uh, it's an immutable force from what I understand. Any questions on that before we go on the next one? Okay, here we go. The next one is the road use tax. So again, this is money we get from the gas tax at the pump and the vehicle registrations. It's based on census allocated on census so we did uh, drop the revenue because potentially our census could be going down in Marshalltown um, since they haven't actually tallied it yet we don't know whether it will go into effect July 1st or thereafter so just trying to be conservative um, again the road use tax pays for salaries of public works and all the projects that you saw on the CIP and the equipment and on the second page is the fund balance so you can see we're starting out at June 30th at 20 at 5.9 million dollars in spending down so we're projecting an ending balance of 2 million between the tornado and the Drake show we've had to defer a lot of projects so now we're catching up any questions on this one Okay, the next one, discussion of maximum property tax levy dollars. So um, last year this time I brought this to you, 
It was a new legislation. So um, it's basically for public information. So they want not only if there's a rate change in your tax levy, but they want the public to see what dollars are changing. So if you go to the actual form, that first column of numbers is what we levied on these particular levies in for fiscal year 21 based on the taxable valuation of $904 million. You go to the second column, the only thing that changed is the taxable valuation. So it's the same as what we know for FY22. So $908 million in valuations. So if you scroll down in the last number there, you can see that um, based, on the, based on the higher valuations, but the same amounts of expenses, that the rate would have gone down from 13.35 to 13.29. And then the last column of numbers is our valuations for FY22 and what we're going to be requesting. So again, we always ask for the maximum regular general levy of $8.10. So in dollars, that goes up $35,000. Uh, publicly owned transit, um, again, we're going to decrease that because of the CARES grant money that will be carried forward. So that decreases the total $225,000. Um, the next line is for this um, Fisher Community Center, no changes. Um, property and liability insurance, again, we are increasing that because of the Draco. So um, that is going to go up 42000 Our local emergency management commission, uh, we got a bill from them or a projection for them. Um, that's going up as well, about $1,200. Um, the emergency money, that's just the flat 27 cents per thousand. Uh, the police and fire retirement, um, again, those rates went up, so we're increasing that. FICA IPERS um, going down slightly. Uh, the rates didn't change, but we have had turnover. So as um, people that are on top of the pay scale leave and people that coming in at the bottom of the pay scale come, you do have a small savings there. And then our other employee benefits are increasing because of the health insurance. So this is a public document. It will need to be published. There will need to be a hearing on it. Um, so do you have any questions? Again, this is not the final tax levy because it doesn't include the debt service levy and the CIP levy and the voted the voted levies, which is the library and the band. Okay. Now I guess we're going to the next topic. So I've given you a lot of information tonight. I kind of wanted to uh, give you a little reality check if our, if our valuations continue on. So the, the chart in the table show what happens if we only ha continue to have a 0.5% growth, which again, we haven't had a growth this low in many, many years. But if it does continue, what's gonna happen? So I, p I uh, figured a 0.5% growth in property taxes and then um, our expenses are basically just the cost, uh, the cost of living adjustments for uh, wages. So that's the only thing that's changing. You can see that our deficit increases quickly. So that's why uh, we're a little concerned about using um, like local option sales tax or anything like that for a permanent, um, a permanent funding of the deficits. So there's really nothing that you need to act on tonight. We just wanted to bring this to your attention to give you some, some kind of numbers that you could work with in the future. Um, like I said, for our general fund, FY21, we're sitting okay because we're gonna have a carry forward. FY22, we do have a deficit, but the deficits probably aren't going to go away. So any questions on this? Your Honor. Yes. 
So I guess with the deficit discussion and everything else, I guess the one thing I, I'm assuming we don't take in consideration is any of this accelerated growth from a housing perspective and property tax revenue generated off of those properties into the future. Well, I think you just really hit on, you know, that there's things that we need to think about of you can cut your way out of things, you can grow your way out of things, and then there's a lot of stuff in between. And certainly, I think that uh, growing is, is something that we need to do. I think one of the things that we've been very uh, cognizant of is that residential rollback is something that does seem to have quite a bit of variability and if it stays at 55 percent or below that's really hurting us it went up a little bit this year but you know not enough to make up for losses in some other classes and so with our multifamily class looking to basically get to that level in fiscal year 2024 as well uh, we're, we're looking at some changes coming up and and what those valuations really do look like but adding more valuation certainly starts to change your your projections here I just I just want to make sure we're not painting a doom and gloom picture when at the end of the day when you have some of the developments that are already existing and some of the conversations that are existing and are active in discussion that changes the landscape of where we're at in six years quite drastically that I if you just look at this table alone I think it, it paints an inappropriate picture to where we're actually at uh, I get that all those things aren't there, not everything's built and everything else, but to sit there and, and use this as the only staple of the conversation for the public's knowledge and everything else <coughs> doesn't take into account all the other stuff that's in progress working and that we're continuing to, to try to drive from the growth of Marshalltown, the community. And I mean, that, that directly has a very, very large impact on that conversation. So I just, I wanna make sure that we keep that abreast of this conversation in parallel because it, it is the same conversation. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's the the great thing about these being projections is you know we can because um, I've I've put together some spreadsheets uh, kind of for that development just to see what a TIF repayment would look like, and so I've got things already figured out with like what would likely assess or what would likely assessed and taxable values equate to. So that's where we can start to mess with that residential piece and see what the residential piece does on that blue line of how much valuation do you need to have to get to you know two percent growth each year in in your valuations um, because it is really i mean residential is our is our biggest class and so i think that's the thing that we have to look at is uh, we have a need um, we have uh, that's that's definitely one thing that's going to help us sort of uh, get to the point where that blue line starts to move and so um, that's certainly why we're we're having the conversations that we're having uh, with developers when they come come around and start talking about single family as well is that we need that valuation to keep moving things forward so I completely agree this is 100% based on assumptions knowing that um, we saw a really bad growth year this year and so how do we make sure that we don't see that again and what does that look like and you're you're 100 percent correct council member Isom, that changing changing the value that you have is um and adding more is one of those ways to make sure that we don't have a deficit uh, i agree and the only thing i add and then i'll be quiet is i the conversation is multifaceted and i just want to make sure we're, we're all aware of that because this this paints the picture that if we don't and aren't willing to grow we will surely shrink so actually yeah. In the big picture of things, in the big picture of things, we're at, we're doing remarkably well, being hit with the two weather events, and still able to um, uh, repair our infrastructures, add to our infrastructures, um, and so if we have to run a deficit, well, we can explain that pretty well. And so the idea is dig out of this, build a new, stop the commuting, get more housing, get more taxes. But that's got to be the message to the rest of the town. Um, brief, Your Honor. Oh, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, briefly, uh, where is this 0.5% figure coming from? Is this from the last year or is this from the last five years? And if Me. not, what is the figure over, you know, the average over the last five years? It comes back to the valuation sheet. When I said we only increased by 0.48%, I just rounded it to 0.5. And so I think it was the prior year where there was actually a negative growth um, the, before the fiscal year 17. 
Um, there was there was one of those years that is that is prior here that was negative where it was basically like a boom we've got to reset again and so there has been some really uh, great years of of growth um, and valuations you know since then um, I think this year came to as, it came to us as a, a fairly big surprise and Diana kind of walked through you know that it, we weren't expecting to lose commercial valuation because you know the the values um, as of January 1 2020 the tornado damage was taken into account on January 1 of 2019. So we, we thought that that had made its way through the system and we hadn't seen anything. So that's where really, you know, it was a, a big surprise in, in determining uh, why things did change so much. And the utility valuations were another piece of that as well. And the FY22 valuations aren't accounting for any impact from the derecho. So could be having another big discussion next year. <laughs> Your Honor. Yes, sir. I want to uh, comment on, on something Councilman Isom said. I, th I think this is serious, the red and blue lines. I think there's some things we could do immediately to mitigate some of that. Yeah. I mean, I think we're all under the understanding that when the census numbers come out, we're going to lose some population. So some of this new housing is just going to get us back to ground zero. You know, then we got to play catch up from there. So I think we need to have some serious conversations about if we go all in on this $10,000, you know, new home thing, I think we need to have conversations about eliminating the three-year tax abatement. We need tax revenue today, you know, not four years down the road. You know, because I think, you know, we're looking at borrowing Where's that at? We're looking at borrowing an, possibly another $6 million on top of what we borrowed last year. And that's $6 million, wasn't it? You know, yeah, I mean. Nine and a half, I think. Well, that was oh, yeah, the awesome big one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, was refunded. I don't want to paint doom either, but I think we need to have some serious conversations about some small steps we can take to, to, to change the way we reward people, you know. Yeah. And I like the idea of the 10,000, I love it, you know, but I want that tax revenue today. You know, it's, all, it's already gonna be, what, it's, a year, it's a year behind anyway. So, right. and I think that can at least get that blue line moving up a little bit. Not, it won't close the gap, but I think it'll parallel it at least with, with, your, with your comment of all the new houses being built. There, you know, there's actually even something simpler that we really have not talked about as a council for probably four years, and that is the franchise fee on gas and electric utilities um, that you can ultimately uh, charge up to 5%. Um, what ends up happening is then you don't pay, as an individual or business, you don't pay local option sales tax on that utility cost. So there's a little bit of a swap, um, and then there's very specific things that it can be used for as well that you would have to approve. But that, that would be something, if we would want to discuss further, um, would be something that would change that blue line um, significantly for the general fund. And could also help the tax levy by um, dedicating more funds to offsetting property tax increases as well. So there's, there's untapped revenues out there as well that we can look at in addition to valuation growth as well. I'm done. Thank you. Should we go on to, uh, boy, it seems like my mic is off. Uh, last discussion item, general fund revenues and five-year projection. Uh, that was what we just did, Your Honor. I thought we were still back on the one right above. <coughs> okay, good. Uh, the I cyclone game started about three minutes ago. Um, time for public comment. Members of the public may make comments on any item not on the agenda during this um, uh, during this time, the speaker shall approach the microphone, state name and address, limit comments to three minutes unless I uh, authorize more, direct the comments to the mayor and council as a whole. The mayor and councilors shall not engage in discussion or debate on items that raised by members of the public and no action may be taken on those in order to comply with the open meetings laws. The microphone is open and the lines are unmuted. Hi, this is Sarah Rosenblum, Library Director. Can you hear me? Yes, Sarah. Go ahead. 
I just want to let the community know that the library is planning to uh, move back to the walkthrough phase next Monday, February 1st. Uh, if everything goes okay, we will uh, resume the hours that we had, the walkthrough hours, which is Monday through Friday, noon to 6. Uh, we will be doing curbside also uh, in the mornings through the end of the day. Uh, we will be adding Thursday morning from 10 to 6. We had a request from families uh, to have more time for uh, parents with napping schedules. So we hope that will work out. And we look forward to hopefully uh, expanding our services. We just want to take it incrementally. Uh, we feel like we've done a very good job with uh, managing COVID and the staff. Um, and so I appreciate the community's um, response and all the outreach. We've gotten a lot of lovely notes and uh, letters from people during this time, and I do appreciate the community's patience with us. Um, the other question that keeps coming up is about income taxes. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, AARP helps um, generally over 300 community members a year with their taxes. Uh, they are still discussing with the national AARP about uh, bringing their volunteers back in. I know we've been getting lots of calls. Um, please feel free to give us a call next week but the ARP volunteers are still negotiating with the national headquarters about can they provide this service uh, during this time. Uh, so thank you everybody for your support of the library. Thank you, sir. Keep up the good work there. Anyone else? Let's go for 10. I have a comment, Your Honor. You bet, go for it. Uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, I think some efficiencies in the meeting tonight that while I understand 2021 and technology gives us the opportunity to host virtual meetings in the climate that we're in today, um, only one seat was allocated from a public member at tonight's meeting. So while I think it's appreciated from the council, those that are able to join virtually and otherwise, I still highly encourage those that are able to join in council um, to participate in such a manner as it's more effective, better use of time, um, and uh, I, that's the only comment I want to address because I think focusing on communication, that technology we have also has issues and uh, more effective manner of our meetings is a better use of all of our time. There is no question we've had less public input when we had to go virtual for the COVID than when people could be here in person. That's a good point. Anyone else? If not, we are adjourned at 8.07 p.m. Go Cyclones. <laughs>